This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. 13 failing schools get new life and new leadership and a look at the importance of Tiger football in the community. Tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. We're joined tonight by a roundtable of reporters looking at a range of stories. First up is Kanji Anthony from Action News 5. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Bill Dries, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. And Don Wade, also from the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for being here. We'll start with the schools bill and a takeover of, or a planned takeover of 13 more schools by um, a combination, failing schools, of the state, the Achievement School District, and also the city changing some things, and I guess I should say the Shelby County school system changing some things. It's interesting for a bunch of reasons, but in part to me that there's, it, it, it's an example of the range of initiatives that are going on in the school system um, that from charter schools to state takeovers to changes in teacher, there's so much going on with this. Um, it all is happening in this next round of schools. Right, these two efforts are, are aimed specifically at the Memphis schools that are in the bottom 5% statewide in terms of student achievement. So you have the Achievement School District, which is run by the state. It's Superintendent Chris Barbic is appointed by the governor of the state. And then you have Innovation Zone schools, which are within the Shelby County school system. So what they did this year, the second year for both of these sets of schools, if you will, is that they basically decided we're going to get together and coordinate which schools we pick uh, so, that, so that we get the most bang for the buck, so to speak. Uh, in the first year, both of these sets of schools have, have worked on feeder patterns into high schools. So that's why there was a need for more coordination this year than, than perhaps in, in the first year. And this is, this, ASD has been taking over a range of schools every year for a few years now. Ultimately, there are some 65 Memphis schools that are on this failing list. And I can't remember, tell me again, how many years it'll take is the plan to, to take over all of them? There are 68 failing schools that are in Memphis within the Shelby County schools system. And the plan for the Achievement School District is for this to take, for, for them to bring them into the top 25% in the state in terms of achievement over a five-year period. Uh, last school year was the very first year of this initiative. We're now in the second school year. These schools that were picked are for the third school year, the 2014-2015 school year. And the, the third year of this will basically involve moving into high schools. Before this, they had only been in elementary and middle school. And that was always part of the problem when, in the past, some of the efforts to, and I think Chris Barbic, who's head of the, the state's effort, the Achievement School District, and others have talked about this, that maybe a, a given school would be improved if it was on the failing list, but then those kids would go into a general population school that wasn't doing well, and it was almost the kind of step back. And that now they're right. trying to create a whole path for these kids from elementary through high school um, as they take over. And again, sometimes it's a charter school model, sometimes it's, it's something else, right? Yeah, and, and Chris has talked about this in particular in Frazier. Um, they've been the, in, in the elementary and middle schools that feed into Frazier High School. What they found was that a lot of the parents of the students who were going to Frazier this year really didn't want their children to go to Fraser High School, which w is one of the schools that would become part of the ASD in the 2014-2015 school year. And so they actually created a ninth grade academy within Westside Middle School to f for those parents who were skittish about that because 20% of the school-aged children in Fraser do not go to schools in that area. They go to private schools, they go to charter schools, right. they go to optional schools outside of Fraser. And when they, the school, when the school system comes in, they, uh, and I know this is true of the ASD, and tell me if it's also true of the, the city's effort, the innovation zone schools, they basically, I mean, the whole staff is, has to reapply for their jobs. They tend to bring in a whole lot of new teachers. I mean, it's a real clean sweep, and it's been somewhat controversial, certainly with the teachers union, but it's, it's a really pretty harsh overhaul when they go in. Is that, that's true of the ASD, but is that also true of the 
innovation zone schools? It's true for the most part and to an extent for the, for the uh, innovation zone schools. Uh, they will probably, in most cases, get new principals in those particular schools as well. We're talking about five schools in, right. the, in the innovation zone that will be added for that particular school year. Uh, in some of the first year innovation zone schools, they had a requirement that they, had, that, that they could retain no more than 50% right. of the faculty. At Ford Road, one of those schools that I went to, they only kept two teachers who had been there before right. the Innovation Zone started. And the other thing that is going on, Chris Barbick was, and Dorsey Hobson, the, the superintendent of uh, the Shelby County Schools, um, at a forum this week that you report on talking about how the, the changing and getting away from hiring teachers just because they've been there forever. That instead, it's more about proving yourself. It's more about giving advancement and raises and more money to people, not so much based on longevity, but based on their performance. And that is a sea change. Um, it's been going on here in Memphis for a while. It's starting to go on across the state. And in other states, other parts of the country has been resisted, you know, vehemently by teachers unions, but it's happening here, right? I mean, it, it, Chris Barbic will come out and hire the best person at the best rate, regardless of their experience. It's more about their proven ability to, to have kids learn. It, it's mostly now shifted, and it's a dramatic shift to how that student right. achieves. What kind of growth do they see with the students? And while it's not been that controversial here, it's certainly been controversial in Nashville. Yeah, yeah. And he, I'm going to quote from Chris Barbrick talking about how in Nashville they've really resisted these kind of reforms. Uh, in other places, you don't see this, the kinds of changes that are going on in Memphis. Um, you look at what, what's going on. He, what's going on in Nashville? It's a very different conversation. They've taken their eye off the ball around quality of students, which is, you know, I don't know. There's always that sort of low-grade competition between Memphis and Nashville. And he spoke very highly of Memphis's willingness to try new things, to innovate, to change, to look at new teachers, and they're really resisting it even in one charter school up in Nashville. Yeah, so. Nashville was upset over having one charter right. school, which right. we've covered in our sister paper, the Nashville Ledger, right. Right. and Memphis has more than two dozen yeah, and charter more, schools. Yeah, and, and that many more on the way, probably. Um, the, uh, we'll move on from there to Tiger football. We're going to come back a little bit to the school board because it can't, went through the county commission, but um, we'll move to you, Don, and Tiger football. Uh, opening weekend was last weekend. Uh, big turnout, some 44,000 people at Liberty Bowl. It was a loss. There was no storybook ending, but there is this sense of a, a new beginning for Tiger football, and, and we wanted to talk about that, that kind of imp impact of the Tigers on the community, not so much the X's and O's and what offense they're running, but just the, the changes that are trying to be made and that some people would say are being made in that program. Well, it's kind of funny. You could almost put it in the same context as the previous topic, a failing football program over a long period of time. Um, I think there's definitely more hope than there's been in quite a while. Part of that's a new athletic director on the scene and Tom Bowen. Part of that's second-year coach Justin Fuente. Uh, I think, truthfully, we're really going to be talking about what's best for the university even, even more than the community if they succeed. But the community certainly can come along for the ride and has a lot to say about them being successful. Justin Fuente was an assistant at TCU in Fort Worth. And he said recently that despite all the winning that program had, it took almost a decade for the people of Fort Worth to sort of embrace TCU as their program. Yeah, they, there were Texas fans and Texas A&M fans, but they also adopted that program. And that's what the university's hoping for. If, if you love Ole Miss or Alabama or whoever, that's fine. Go ahead. But love the University of Memphis football right. program, too. And, and there is, I mean, the... the I don't know if the word is a precedent, but with, you know, Tigers basketball is clearly, I mean, the Tigers are the city's team. It's not just, you know, uh, alumni who are at those games, you know, 18,000 people at the FedEx Forum. And is it, I mean, is it realistic that Tiger football gets to be mm -hmm. that popular or at least on a, on a, in that kind of realm of popularity within the city? Is that their goal over the next decade? I think Tiger football is trying to find its niche. And yeah. if it finds its niche, there's a possibility down the road to have enhanced opportunities. And by that, I mean there's going to be another round of conference realignment and expansion. We know that. The University of Memphis was essentially the previous administration asleep at the wheel, to be, to be real blunt about it, when expansion first took off. And so now the Big East becomes the American Athletic. They're able to jump from Conference USA. It's an improvement. It's only a slight improvement. But someday the Big 12, 
will add teams. Right. Memphis wants to be one of those teams, and of the major conferences out there, that's the one that makes the most sense geographically. And, you know, to people listening who think, well, you know, it's just football, it's just a game, it, it's also big business. I mean, it is oh, sure huge it is. big business in terms of, of the amount of money, the, the TV revenue and all that. It's also, like it or not, um, it means a lot to people in terms of donating, donating money to the school, attending the school. And so all those things become important. Again, like it or not, sports are a big part of the college experience for people. So as the university tries to grow and attract students and retain students who might otherwise go out of town, having a good football team, having a meaningful football experience is important to those kids. Well, whether people like it or not, the football program at most universities makes it possible for there to be a golf team, a rifle right. team. And, you know, look at it this way. If the Tigers basketball team sells out FedEx Forum, 18,000 people, you get a low crowd at Liberty Bowl Memorial Stadium of 24,000, you know, still 6,000 right. more. Right. So, you know, football is its own animal in that way and the ability it has to kind of lift other parts of the university and the, and the athletic program. And in the other part of this, talking about the conference realignment thing, which again gets into money and stature and, and across, and you make a great point about not just the, the big ticket football and, and uh, uh, basketball programs, but all the other sports. If, I mean, the people are fear that, that while the, the Memphis basketball team is really an elite, you know, top 20, you know, regularly top 25 kind of program in the country, could be in any, you know, any realignment, they're a very attractive team, an attractive school. But if football drags basketball down, basketball could suffer, right? I mean, that's part of the fear in this in terms of the realignment that, that Memphis doesn't get into the Big 12 or doesn't get into one of these big conferences, even though people love the basketball team because that football team's no good. I, I think the basketball program, for the most part, can sustain re regardless of that. And I think that's been proven. You know, what John Calipari did uh, when they were in Oop. conference. <laughs> yeah, that, that, don't mention that name in Memphis, right? <laughs> and, and what Josh Pastner's done to, to a great extent. Now, the, the schedule will be a lot better this year with them being in the American Athletic Conference. Some of those good games are going to go away because, you know, Louisville, right, for instance, right. will be leaving right. the conference. But, you know, they're capable of scheduling national games. It's really how much do you want to do that and trying to find that, that happy balance where you don't overschedule, but you get enough to where your strength of schedule is good enough that it'll help you when the NCAA is looking at seating. They obviously didn't do quite a good enough job of that the last couple of years because they right. probably could have had a better seat if they'd had a better schedule. Yeah, all right, well thank, thank you very much. We move on now to uh, an election preview. Um, as anyone who watches so regularly knows that this always just, I, I get so confused, Bill, there are too many elections, it's, I'm editorializing, but there are so many elections. And as you said, there are now 11 in the area, in Shelby County, 11 elections in the next three months. Right, between now and Thanksgiving, 11 elections. Let me run it down for you. <laughs> yes, I please do. You know. <laughs> uh, we have regular municipal elections in Lakeland and Arlington, that's two. We have two for state House District 91, that's the seat that the late Lois DeBerry held, will have primaries and a general election there. We have six elections for suburban school boards coming up in November, and there's no firm date for it yet, but we will have a referendum on a increase in the city sales tax rate. So that's your 11 right there. So let's go to the sales tax. That's probably the one that will get the most attention, I have a feeling. I mean, we know kind of how certain things are going to turn out, but the, they're going to go ahead with this, even though there was a tax increase in the, 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 the county. A property tax. A property tax increase, thank you. Um, who's behind the, the city tax increase? And w w they're talking about allocating that money to specific educational purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, some pretty powerful players behind it. The two originators of it are, are Shay Flynn and Jim Strickland on the Memphis City Council. And the way this is being sold to voters in the city is uh, this half cent, this half percent, uh, it generates $47 million in revenue. They would use $30 million of that to expand pre-kindergarten within the city of Memphis. The city would run the program through a trust fund with a board over it, and then any remainder would go to roll back the city's property tax rate. And how, you know, people, I'm sure, listen and roll their eyes and say, well, yeah, $30 million to, to, to pre-K, maybe I'm all for pre-K, but they say these kinds of things. 
but it just doesn't happen. It just all goes in the big pot, and, and it, that, that what, what's promised doesn't, doesn't play out. Kanji, you want to comment on that at all? I mean, I don't know how much you've been covering that, but don't you think people are skeptical when they say, oh, we promise 30 million of this is going to go to um, pre-K? Well, from what I've understood, uh, it's going to be put in writing. And I know, you know, people can look back and say, oh, well, what about the wheel tax? Where's that money? Um, but uh, this is what they're saying. Uh, you have to try to believe the people that you put into office. Yeah, yeah. So, and it, what, this will come in the, in the fall, in the next three months. They haven't set a date yet? The, they haven't set a firm date. The Election Commission attorney says this is most likely going to be November 21st, so we'll save one date because that is, uh, I believe, the same date that you're going to have the general election for State House District 91. Right. So put them both on the same ballot. And, and you're right. I mean, a, a year ago, we were voting on a countywide sales tax increase that absolutely sunk like a stone. It didn't, it, it had a general assurance that, yeah, this will go for pre-K, but it didn't have the board in place and the trust fund aspect. And that's one of the reasons that, that Flynn and Strickland tied this thing down to so many conditions is because there was open right. skepticism right. a year ago on this. And what, what kind of, the so there's 30 million going towards uh, pre-K, the other part towards tax relief on the property tax side. Mm -hmm. What would that translate to? Do either of you know? Um, you're in you're terms talking of your about, um, I believe, you're talking less than 20 million uh, because the number for pre-K went up by about 3 million. Yeah. So $47 million in revenue total, 27 million, uh, I'm sorry, 30 million. So you got See, 17 even million. I'm confused. <laughs> even you're confused. Well, the so number has changed. If you've got 17 million going to, to relieve property taxes, it's right. a probably small relief. I mean, we're talking probably pennies on, on everyone's tax rate as, as it might come down. Any other election you want to you want to highlight that are well, important? The school board? Oh, go ahead. One thing that is interesting is there is an election that may be, and that is mm -hmm. the one uh, between uh, Kevin Woods and Kenneth Whalum Jr. Uh, of course, we all know that that was a situation where uh, a voided election occurred, and so now we're looking at the possibility of yet another one. And that's but for the school board. For the school board. We're keep track of Right, on District all 6. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. So. And they've just now lowered their number down to seven, right? I mean, the, the for, school board. Correct. For, well, no, for, for, for State House District 91, oh, you, you have seven candidates <laughs> who are running in the Democratic primary for that. Which, this is, I'm editorializing is again because this is why, I mean, I follow this stuff pretty closely. We write about this stuff pretty closely. It's too many elections, and I don't, I'm not there saying people lot. shouldn't vote, there but it lot. gets so confusing because you lose track. I mean, you hear those stories in California where they have all those referendums and everyone gets confused. It's almost like we're in that boat where it's confusing, and I do. I read your articles, and I get I, I get confused by what's going on, but we'll cover this. We'll stay on it. But there and are seven members. You were right. There, there are seven, seven members. members. I was right about board. one thing. Thank yes. you. So, yeah, as, yeah, that, oh, yeah, that as well. Yeah, I was right about one thing. We move now to the county commission. Um, you've been covering that, as has Bill, but Kanji, it's gotten real tense, to put it lightly, over the last couple of weeks. There's a lot of interpersonal tensions, maybe driven by political and, and policy differences, but it's, it's gotten pretty heated over the last uh, recent days. I've been following this body for uh, nearly a decade, and I will say that this sitting county commission had the ugliest meeting to date. Uh, you had uh, all of society's ills you have them all in one room. Each person is representing a certain group of people. And all of society's ills played out this week. You had three things going on. You had sexism being thrown up, accusations of sexism, accusations of ethics violations. Um, uh, then you had uh, the word racism being thrown around. Uh, you had um, Heidi Schaefer um, was up for budget chair. And some of the Democrats did not want her in that position. They wanted to put Melvin Burgess, Commissioner Melvin Burgess, in that position. And she said she felt it was sexism uh, because there had been other, uh, for instance, uh, Mike Ritz, uh, his budget chair was a Democrat. So she said she, she canceled out the fact that it could be party politics. And she felt that it was her sexism. Uh, it was sexism against right. her. And there were people in, in the room with signs, Heidi Schaefer signs, supporting her. She right. ended up winning out on this. And then the really ugly um, battle that went uh, on was between uh, Terry Rowland and uh, Sidney Chisholm. You were in that room there too, Bill. Mm -hmm. um, Terry Rowland accused Sidney Chisholm of voting for his cousin for a school board appointment. 
And he, right in the middle of the meeting, just said, you just violated ethics, and got up and walked over and was communicating with the uh, county attorney. And, uh, you know, they had to get order in the room. And then Sidney Chisholm fired back and said, you don't like black folks, uh, quote unquote. And he said that he had ties to the KKK. And, and it was just, it was chaos. <laughs> I mean, it's not, I'm laughing. It's not funny, but it's a yeah. circus, Bill. I mean, it, would you agree? I mean, you've covered county commission for something more than ten years. I mean, is it? it, it, it Kanji said it was the ugliest thing she'd seen. Yeah, and and this was this was James Harvey's first meeting right. as chairman of the commission, which he will be for the next year, which I think had had a lot to do with it. To challenge a chairman's committee appointments in a formal way, to actually take it to a contested vote by the county commission is exceedingly rare in the history of the county commission. There are commissioners who are routinely not happy with the committee assignments they get from the chairman, but usually that stays behind the scenes. Yeah, and you they, hear rumblings, people yeah. saying, mm -hmm. I don't want to do this. Right, more, yeah. more hurt feelings <laughs> but and they, bruised they egos move on. than They'll talk than to outright. each other privately about it, even though it's a violation of the Sunshine Law. <laughs> uh, but, but, um, but, but they generally work it out. This was an open challenge of that, and it does not bode well for the the next year with Harvey as chairman. And, and this starts in part with Harvey, you know, you, one of you correct me if I'm wrong, Harvey, who is a Democrat, um, then was elected with Republican support, Dem other Democrats on the county committee, he was chastised by, or, or censured, right, by yes. the, the local Democratic Party, um, the other other Democrats, maybe not all of them, but other Democrats on the the county commission say that he cut a deal. They're saying he's the acting like a Republican. I mean, so it's just yeah, yeah. And but they're angry. It's personal and it's policy, right? And it's politics, but it's it's real ugly. Um, Harvey's in for a year. Is that what you said? Yeah. And then there'll be a new election, so it's a one-year term for county commission right. chair. The chairmanship chair. rotates. The budget committee chairmanship does rotate, although the commission has been known to, to keep the same person in that post across chairman, right. simply because it's such a critical position. Right. And is it, am I not right that, that it used to be that the city council was known for this kind of stuff? And now, they, not that they, it's all happy kumbaya on the city council, but they don't have these kind of eruptions in, in, in this way. They have differences of opinion, definitely. We've had city council people on the show, but not this kind of personal, really, uh, this hostility that now is on the county commission. I know what the game changer was. It was the uh, the school the school fight. Yeah. I would say it was the fight over the school merger. It just changed everything. Yeah, yeah. And, and another um, very interesting point, uh, the battle between Terry Rowland and Sidney Chisholm, um, what some may not know is that there is a lawsuit going on where uh, Terry Rowland is suing Sidney Chisholm for uh, what he calls a, a past, past ethics violations, uh, voting for Head Start funding, and he says that Sidney Chisholm's daycare benefited from it. So you also have this backdrop that's going on uh, that I think escalated the tensions. Yeah, yeah. And it's like a reality show, and I don't mean that, I shouldn't mean that flippantly, but let's move on to our final story, which is the 19th Century Club. Um, the 19th Century Club, Kanji, is in a, a old historic uh, home building in Midtown along Union. Um, it has been sold. The club has not been real active for quite some time. It's a, a beautiful old building, has, has, you know, the historic folks uh, view it as having great value, um, but it's been bought and is under threat of demolition. That's right. And so it, uh, four members of the 19th Century Club sued the executive committee and said that uh, they were not included in the vote to sell the building. And uh, what they're wanting is someone who will take over the building, who will preserve it. And so then you have the uh, Memphis Heritage. Uh, they are preservationists. They're now involved in this uh, lobbying to not uh, have a demolition. Then you have uh, the Children's Museum that got dragged into this because uh, the money from the sale of that building went to the Children's Museum. And so now uh, they're involved in this lawsuit as well. Uh, right now, where it stands is that the judge is going to allow this uh, building to be sold, allow the demolition. However, there's um, they have 14 days from the ruling uh, to appeal. This decision. So, I have, as I understand it, there is an appeal um, that is being prepared to uh, prevent this sale from happening. And there's a, I, I, I heard, I got an email or something from Memphis Heritage or someone associated with it saying that there is a buyer, they think, for a Nashville person right. who is, I picked on Nashville earlier, now, now I'm not, um, 
who is interested in buying it and preserving the home and you know using it as a restaurant and as an event space. And it, it goes back, Bill. I mean, the, the city's history with um, these fights um, over you know people don't realize it necessarily, but way back in time, Union Avenue was quite a grand avenue filled with grand homes, uh, churches, and so on. Much of that you know was was lost through. Uh, urban redevelopment, I guess, in the 60s and 70s. Um, it even goes back to the fight of going through Overton Park and going through Evergreen Historic District. I mean, there's some real open wounds and, and bitter battles in the past. This is, some people would say, well, it's just one building and it's kind of defunct and, you know, it's sort of leaky, but there's a, there are bigger issues at play. Yeah, uh, about, the, about the only thing that you could find more um, emotion over in terms of demolishing something is if you wanted to cut down some trees in Midtown. Then it, it, would, it would really be on in, in a large way. But yeah, uh, Union Avenue, some of the folks who are involved in this fight go back to the fight over the Hill Mansion. Napoleon Hill, who was a cotton millionaire, whose mansion was not too far from where the 19th Century Club is now. Um, the whole CBS Union Avenue Methodist Church at right. Union and Cooper is an example of another battle. And on the one side, you have the preservationists who say, we're losing a vital part of our identity, our architecture. On the other side, you have the people who say, well, look, it's good to talk about offers, but where is the money on, right. the, t on the table? Who put the money on the table and, and who didn't? And in this case, the argument has been, the Lynn family who put up the money to buy this, they actually put the money on the table. The other people, the alternate offers, they talked about it, but they didn't put the money on the table. Right, yeah. that was the one viable bid is what they said. Mm -hmm. And uh, something that's happening right now uh, with the Lynn family, um, I understand that um, they own a seconds. restaurant um, and there is now, uh, the Memphis Heritage folks are calling in to threaten boycotting the restaurant. Yeah, so it's getting yeah. heated. It's gonna, it's ugly. All right, well, thank you all, Don, Kanji, Bill, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week. Good night.